Hello, my name is Ryan Davenport. I'm the youth pastor and I'm one of part of the teaching team. And it's such an honor and a privilege to be up here to be able to pour um, into you guys and be a vessel that pours into you. And I love, I've known about this topic for a while. I've kind of known where I was going. I was really excited about it. And, um, and I was just super charged to bring this message to you. And, and like always, I think what, what the enemy likes to do, what Satan likes to do, is to absolutely throw a wrench into me during the week of. And usually, he, he, I, maybe it's like he wants to see if I truly believe the words that I'm saying, but I do believe that sometimes I struggle. And this should have been a week of joy. Like, it really was. Like, I got to spend time with just me, my father-in-law, and my daughter on 4th of July to watch her at a three-year-old just experience fireworks to the moment that she can comprehend was just amazing. And just the fact that she'd be like, fireworks, I love you. Fireworks, I love you. And it was just this moment of joy. And then I had my nephew that was born on July uh, July 4th too. And that was just such a joyous moment in our family. And it was just, it was a great moment. But I was struggling to be joyful in that moment. We come here on on Friday night to do practice. And I love when our youth leads worship. I love their energy. And I was just a cranky Gus. I don't know what else you can say. Like everything just bothered me. I was frustrated at my sermon. Like I would look at my notes and I would be like, ugh, this is so, I just don't feel this. And I don't know what's going on. And I went home and I just was, I was frustrated. I was angry. And so I just closed the laptop. And I remember the video when I was searching for the video and in the line that said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And that line kept running through my head and I knew that I needed to find joy. So I put the laptop down and I just started looking for joy that day. Saturday was a better day, and I, I looked for joy. And even though there was times the enemy tempted me to, to be frustrated, I remember to find the joy in what we are doing. There are many things on this earth that we believe give us joy slash happiness. Things that we may think that gives us joy is maybe our families, our jobs, money, health, sports, etc. We can name different things that we think that gives us joy joy. And for many of these, that the feeling of joy is not sustainable. Well, that's because in all of these things can cause us hurt and pain. For many of us, life can be hard and there can be daily circumstances that seem to conspire us to rob us of our joy. And maybe that you're stuck in a job that you do not like or doesn't pay enough money to pay the bills. Maybe you're, in a, you're having a difficult period in your marriage or that you have a rough, strange relationship with a family member. Maybe that you're trying to follow Jesus, but the people in your life are not allowing you to commit and walk a life worthy of the calling. Maybe it's even basic health problems that makes even the simplest, most basic everyday activities difficult. And let's be real here for just a second. Maybe it's sports. Now, I'm a sports fan, and I have, throughout my life, allowed sports to dictate my happiness, to dictate where I'm going to be. And it's all of us. We put so much hope and joy. If so-and-so catches a touchdown on Saturday, it affects how we worship on Sunday. And we, and we live in this culture, and I think it's great that we can rally around some stuff, but we make it so about that sports brings us together. And yes, it's a great thing, but here's the secret about sports. Your team will eventually lose. My wife had to learn that early in our marriage when she came in. Like, I was a big San Francisco Giants fan, and when we got married, they won three World Series. And she's like, she expected this. And in one year, about 2019, she turns to me and she says, why are they so bad? And it's the point is, is when we put hope into things of this world, it will fail us. They're not sustainable and they're not consistent. We live in a culture that determines joy and happiness on things that are not sustainable. And that is a false belief system that we have. In the midst of these realities, experiencing a constant, deep, long-lasting joy can seem unattainable. I hear a lot of people that say, I'm not happy with my situation. And that's where I believe that word happy throws a wrench into our joyous life. Before we can learn how to overcome with joy, we need to understand what biblical joy is and how it differs from early happiness, earthly happiness. And here's one of the things that that I looked. I googled happy in the Bible. Scriptures that talk about happy, and this article popped up, and it had about 35 scriptures. And in the 35 scriptures, nothing talked about happiness. It was all about joy. 
And even the author of this thing compared joy and happiness as interchangeable. And I don't believe that's true. And I think if we look at the definitions between joy and happiness, we can see that. So we have to understand what that is. See, joy and happiness are wonderful feelings of, to experience, but they are very different. And our culture has come to a false belief sister, system that joy and happiness are the same, but they are very different. And don't get me wrong, it's okay to be happy, but it's important that we see the difference. So here's some definitions. Joy is a more consistent and is cultivated internally. Where happiness tends to be externally triggered and is based off other people, things, places, thoughts, and events. And I believe a good foundation of joy can bring happiness. And this will be important for us to understand as we go forward today. And through my short time on this earth and trying to walk this life worthy of a calling, I have found that the enemy tries to steal our joy in life. Most of you can agree he is a mastermind of playing mind games and using our situations to make the life that's worthy of the calling not worth it. But yet when I read the Bible, I repeatedly see themes that talks about experiencing a kind of joy that transcends our circumstances. If we go back to the worldly definition of happiness, happiness comes from our situation, comes from our circumstances. But yet the theme that I see is a kind of joy that transcends our circumstances. I love the different words that you can use for transcends, surpass, excels, exceeds, beats, trumps, tops, caps, outdo, outstripes, leaves behind, outrivals, outranks, outshines, eclipse, oversteps, overshadows, upstage our circumstances. A kind of joy that transcends our circumstances. The biggest question for us is how do I find that kind of joy. And the answer sometimes to all of us seems so hard, but yet it is here in the Word of God. And what we need to realize is our only joy is rooted and has a foundation in Christ Jesus. The only thing that is proven to be consistent and sustainable in life. Let me hear that again. Our joy is rooted and has a foundation in Christ Jesus. The only thing that is proven to be consistent and sustainable in life. We're going to bring up the working definition while we keep going of joy, because I think joy can continually be defined. And so we go to the next slide. Joy can be defined as a constant, cultivated internally, and confidently abiding in the vine of Jesus. It's knowing that all of our life comes from the vine, and it's knowing that all of it comes from the vine, but it's also that our future expectations, that everything is going to be okay, draws life from the vine of Jesus, no matter what our circumstances is. We see this in John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. But for without me, you can do nothing. We need to be a part of, of this spiritual vine. We need to connect to Jesus. Instead of connecting to other things that are of this world or as earthly things that can deteriorate, we need to connect to the vine of life. And I love the word abide. It's not a word that we use in our language. Like, when's the last time you used abide? Anybody? But it is a very important word. So I, I, I googled it, and I love the definition. To bear patiently. Another definition is to endure without yielding, to withstand. The intransive verb is to remain stable or fixed in a state. We must stay stable and fixed in the vine of Jesus Christ. We must be, absolutely hold on to that. See, Jesus told his disciples that he wanted them to experience the fullness of his joy in their lives. We see that in John 14, 11, John 16, 24, and later we will go into John 17, 13. But as Jesus knew that the hard times were awaiting his disciples, and they needed to understand the fullness of joy that was inside him. See, my thought is to believe that, that there was joy that was just abundant in Jesus, and he had an unbreakable joy, although he knew 
he knew what was coming at the end because he knew the power of God's grace and mercy. And when we think about his fleshy side, I bet he was, there was a fear and there was probably a moment of this is going to hurt. But yet he had such a joy that transcended him that he knew that when he went upon that cross, death was defeated. He knew that victory was coming. He knew that you and I were going to be saved through him. And he found joy in that moment. And throughout the rest of the New Testament, we keep seeing the theme of that joy that transcends our circumstances. We see it all the time, and we, and we continue to see it with, with Paul, the champion of joy. We see it in James, we see it in Peter, we see it in Hebrews. We see it throughout the whole New Testament that is one of the biggest lessons that we can learn is that Jesus, because Jesus laid the expectation down early to have joy. I'm coming, we see in, in John 17, 13, I'm coming for you now, but I say these things while I'm still in this world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Once again, this joy that Jesus had when he was going upon that cross, this joy of people's lives that were going to be changed, that once again, that death was going to be defeated. And out of all the books of the Bible, among the most joyous, are the prison letters that Paul wrote. And I think Paul very much had this kind of joy, and I want to look at it through his eyes, because Paul is a perfect example of the joy that transcends our circumstances. And here's the deal. We're going to say that a lot in the sermon, the joy that transcends our circumstances, because so many times as humans, we get stuck in our circumstances. And we don't allow to see the joy of what is God is doing in our lives. And we see that more with Paul when he wrote these letters in, while he was enduring his imprisonment in Rome. The books of Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon are all books that he was writing while he was imprisoned in Rome. Now you think at this point of Paul's journey, he would be the one that needed to be encouraged. But it was so cool is he was the one that was giving the encouragement. And here's a quick side note about studying the Bible. It's something that I, I always want to explain. You have to understand the context of what you're reading. When you read a book like Philippians that's full of joy, you need to understand where Paul was writing from because he was writing from imprisonment. But yet he had so much joy as we see that the whole book of Philippians is saturated with joy. Sixteen times over four short chapters, Paul uses the word rejoice or joy to describe the state of mind or the general attitude that we should have as Christians. As he writes this joy-soaked letter in the midst of his own difficult circumstances, see, let's look at it. He was under a house arrest that he was paying for under his own pocket, he was, uh, he was chained to a Roman soldier every three hours. Uh, he, on top of that, three years, ago, three years before that, he spent prison, uh, time in prison in Caesarea. So by the time that Paul wrote Philippians, he had been in Roman custody for several years. But yet, rather than allow his circumstances to drive him to despair, he experiences deep joy and pleaded with the Philippians to share in his joy. This is the man that when he was in prison, worshipped God and sang. This is the man when he was in prison, brought his jailer to Jesus. This was the man when he was in prison, wrote letters to others. Don't worry about me. I need you to take this joy, this joy of the final end game that Jesus has won and share it with the world. What I love about Paul is even this. Paul refers to his intense suffering as a light affliction compared with the far more exceeding and external weight of glory that awaits God's servants at the resurrection. And we see that theme in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17, and also in Romans 8, 18. What a great attitude to have. But how did Paul get here? Before God called him, Paul was a hard-hearted, angry, persecuting, Christian-killing kind of person. But after his conversion, he was transformed into a loving and joyous person, partly because he understood the magnificent generosity of God's grace and mercy. Let's take a moment to look in his shoes. After his conversion, he was truly understanding this mercy and this grace. A grace is a gift that he did not deserve. Mercy, mercy was shown to him instead of punishment. 
For anyone that reads about Paul, we think that he is the one that does not deserve the mercy and the grace of God. The man was killing Christians, but yet God showed him mercy and grace. And I believe that Paul truly let go in this moment and allowed it to saturate his life and change him. Paul let God take the past from him and allowed himself to fully be renewed. And I think many times where we fall short is we don't truly allow God to take our past from us and let us truly be renewed. Paul did not want to live in that life. He did not want to be that angry, persecuting, Christian kind of dude. He wanted to be fully immersed in the mercy and grace and the love of Jesus. Paul had a joy that could overcome anything because he knew the magnitude of the grace and mercy of God. He knew that Jesus had already defeated death and that we needed to run this race to the finish so the good news of his good grace can be shared with everyone. Paul did not let his personal circumstances affect how he lived this life worthy of the calling. We see Paul's joy in Christ was in everything that he did. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, 11, I have learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. And for joy to be sustainable in us, contentment is a large part of joy. But contentment is not a word that we're very good at. We can be very impatient and we cannot be content. So I wanted to dig deeper and look at the definition of contentment. And that is the quality or state of being contented. Now that is actually a word. My wife challenged me on that and we made sure that that's what Webster's dictionary said. And so I looked at the definition of contented and that is feeling or showing satisfaction of one's possession, status, or situation. I wanted to dig even deeper and go to the Greek word, and here's the deal. I am not a Greek scholar. I did not take Greek in college, so I will give you the California slash Arkansas version of this Greek word. It is al, okay, al's tarkis. All right, that's better. I'll do better next time. But it's sufficient for oneself, strong enough or possessing enough to need no aid or support. So are you content in Jesus? Are you content in his grace and mercy? When he says, I am content in this situation, I see from Paul, through all his earthly struggles, a contentment in Jesus Christ, that even though things are not going the way that we want, he finds joy in God and Jesus. Even though you can't rejoice in your circumstances, if you find yourself passing through pain and sorrow and grief, you can still rejoice in Christ. We can still rejoice in the Lord, and since he, has never, he never leaves us and he will never forsake us, we can rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. So what? No wonder that Paul instructs us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Not to focus on our circumstances, but to focus our minds on the beauty and the glory of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And allowing God to stir our hearts with a joy that can transcend our circumstances. This is what I know that our circumstances can change constantly. But because of Hebrews chapter 13, 8, that I know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when we seek joy in him, we will never be disappointed. But unlike our circumstances, Jesus never changes. In Psalms 19, 8, David writes, The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. God's precepts are his directives that he gives us in the Bible that lead to joy, at least in two ways. First, God's way is right, which means he knows what what he's doing. He knows what's best for you, so trust him. Listen to his commandments. Live this life worthy of the calling. Once again, he knows what he is doing. 
Second, the scripture leads to joy that points us to a God once again. Say it with me. Who transcends our circumstances and who promises to be with us in the midst of difficulties. Jesus gives us the greatest, once again, the greatest example of joy in the spite of his circumstance. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 3 says it in such a beautiful way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, For the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and set down at the right hand in the throne of God. Consider him who endures such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus had so much joy that it endured the cross. He scorned its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of God, and he became the victory. So why can we not have joy in that? In a world that so is unstable and so is inconsistent in our life, why do we put so much hope in that when we have the most consistent thing, and that is Jesus? He was and is and will always be that consistent part. So why don't we have joy in that? Why don't we find that? We so desperately want something that's consistent, but so many times we forget that it's right there. So now what? Remember that joy is from viewing the day's events from an eternal perspective and not an earthly perspective. Trust that God controls your life details, Romans 8, 28, that he hears your every request. Uh, We see that in Psalms 116, uh, I'm sorry, 116 verse 1, and that the joy will be your strength. We see that in Nehemiah 8, 10. We need to learn how to have joy. We need to cultivate that in our lives because Satan is so good at distracting us. He is so good at putting our circumstances in the way of what it means to have joy in Jesus. Just like anything, we need to practice. We need to practice what we preach, and we need to have these steps. And so I did some research, um, found some things online, did some things that I thought of. But here are seven practical ways for us to increase joy in our lives. Rehearse it with God and the reasons that you trust him. Tell him in prayer which attributes are your favorite in his, that he has in your life. Read praises of scripture back to him. Join with other believers and pray a prayer of thanksgiving and delight yourself in his character. Immerse yourself in the reasons that you trust him. The second one is keep a, a, joy, a joy journal. Some of you have a prayer journal, and that's great, but also keep a joy journal. Record the reasons that you have rejoiced and the reminders of why God is faithful and that you encounter every day. Because we know it may not be in your life, but you've seen in your friend's life or a family member's life or your children's life how God brings joy and write it down. Because mostly when we don't write down things, we don't remember it. So when you are in those moments of those circumstances and you're struggling and you feel like the world is bearing down on you, you can open up that journal, read the moments of joy, go into Scripture, and celebrate the faithfulness that God has. Third, surround yourself around joyful people. Joy is contagious, so build relationship with friends who exhibit that confidence in God. Pray for each other that your joy in Christ will be increased. But here's the deal. The enemy will put joy suckers in your life. We know who they are. And sometimes we get so caught up in our circumstances, we become that joy sucker. We want everybody to feel the misery that we are feeling, but yet we need to be the people that are sharing the joy with people. I love when you talk to these people that are struggling and they're like, it's okay because God is in control. They lift you up and you can see the joy. Our purpose is to show people of this world, no matter what our circumstances are, our joy will overpower it. Approach life's challenges and trials with joy. 
God doesn't waste difficult circumstances in your life, but he uses them to develop character. James chapter 1, 2 through 4 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face uh, face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. So when you face those tough times, that is a hard scripture to see when James says, take joy in these trials because you know it's going to produce perseverance. This run, this this journey that we have is going to be long. It's going to be hard, but it's already won for you. You just need to live this life worthy of the call and finish. Listen to what God tells you to do and you're going to be okay. Take joy in those moments when you are challenged. Take moment of those trials because you are becoming stronger. You're becoming more mature and complete, lacking nothing if you are praising and are in tune with the vine of Jesus. Make praise and gratitude a habit. Okay, for the ones that know me, let's be real for a second. I'm terrible at saying thank you. I say it in here. I don't say it out here. We have to be a better people of saying thank you, not just to each other, but to God. We have to say thank you for everything. Has God met a need? Praise him for it. Has God uh, challenged, has God given you, or have you seen challenges and he's worked through those and have grown you? If you've seen those opportunities, thank him for it. The joy that flows from gratitude and a responsive heart is the best. Before you turn in tonight, write down the blessings or the joys that you have seen. Make it a habit to have a joyful attitude. The next one, take the long view. You know, I'm kind of looking at finances right now, and I've talked to a couple of my friends that are investors, and, you know, the one thing that I always hear is don't worry about the daily ups and downs of your funds in the stock market. Don't even look at it. I got you. I'll take care of it. And I think we do that a lot in life, that we're so worried about what's happening now, but we don't realize that there is a longer view we need to look at. There are people that need to know Jesus. There are people's lives that need to be changed. There are people that need to experience the joy that we are experiencing, but also know at the end of that journey is victory. Focus on that. Focus on the glory of Christ Jesus. God reminds that your days will change, but he will faithfully develop character in you. And the last one is my favorite. It's the one that means so much to me. It's fill your mind with worship and praise. I have found myself in the darkest of times, in the deepest of times, going to worship and praise. If anybody knows me, and I know that Dixie is sick of me by now, but I I listen to so much worship music and I listen to songs, and songs speak to me. And when I'm in a, in a not a good place, I listen to the words. I allow it to, to sing and to meditate on the words, to draw my heart to, near to God and his words. Today, we have that opportunity to worship, to be joyous, to be excited for what God has done for us. And I've heard this. I think Spencer has said this. I've heard this with some other preachers. We go crazy when somebody hits a home run or scores a touchdown, but yet we sow no joy when Jesus shows up in our lives. I mean, I'll, I'm going to rattle myself. I chest bumped the wall once because I had nobody to celebrate when, I won the world, when my team won the World Series. But when God shows up in my life, what do I do? Does my joy transcend my circumstances? We need to be there. And we have an opportunity today to sing and to praise and to worship him. We have a moment of communion that we do every Sunday, and I love it. It's an intimate and beautiful moment where we have groups that come together. People go off by themselves, but it is a moment that we can share in the joy of what Jesus did for us. The joy of a body that was broken. The joy of blood that was shed, so this juice that represents juice. I'm sorry, let me start over again. This juice that represents blood that has been shed and made us anew. How can we not show joy in that moment? But so many times, 
Satan is perfect of trying to get us caught up in our circumstances. Because if he gets us caught up in our circumstances and we don't buy into the joy of Jesus Christ, then he is winning. He wants to absolutely destroy us and what God wants to do is wants him to know that the victory has already happened. We have to have joy in everything that we do. Amen? We have to let it absolutely seek from everything that we do, everything that we say. People need to know that we have a joy that what? Transcends our circumstances. That's important to know because we will face hard trials and tough moments. But this joy through Christ Jesus, which we find in the vine of Jesus, will provide and take care of us. So what is preventing you from having joy? Are you stuck in this earth? Are you stuck in this world? Or are you fully committed to living this life worthy of the calling? Paul did not live in the past. He lived in the joy and the victory of what Christ has done in his life. So may you live with that victory. May you live with that joy. And may we come and worship and sing and praise him with all of our heart and all of our soul. Amen? So let us have a time of worship, a time of communion. We have stations around, but let us worship. Let us do it with joy, and let's walk out those, do those doors with a joy that is so contagious that when people see us, they go, there's something different about that person. I want to know. And then we have an opportunity to share Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for who you are and who you will always be. God, as we come here and we submit ourselves to you, God, we submit ourselves to the most sustainable and most beautiful thing that we have in our life. God, I pray for everyone in this room that is struggling with their personal circumstances, that they will realize that you have already won the victory, that you will provide, that you will help them, you will pull them out of that moment, that you will always be there for them. God, I pray for ones in this room that need to reestablish to the vine of Jesus. God, I'm calling that there is revival today in this room. I call for these people that have, have become joy suckers, that they will reattach themselves to the vine of Jesus, and they will be filled with your joy, they will be filled with your Holy Spirit, and they will truly buy into this process. So God, I pray for a revival of joy, a revival of commitment. God, let us worship you with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. And let's declare that we are thankful for Jesus going upon that cross and dying so that we may have life. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for what you have done in each and every one of our lives. Thank you for what you are going to do. Thank you for the thousands, the millions, the billions that will know your name. And we thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.